And this, so basically the talk is Chagas disease in the United States, what OBGYNs need to know. Um, I'm gonna talk about a non-FDA approved medication, Nifertimox, for about two seconds, but that's my disclosure. Um, my goals for today are to reacquaint you with this fascinating disease, to convince you that you'll see it if you look for it, to describe who you should screen and to update you about current recommendations for therapy. The map on the right side of the screen shows where Chagas disease used to be um, thought to be found in the world. And those are the countries in red where there's vector-borne transmission. But as people understood that there's been massive migration out of these areas into other parts of the world, the side of the map on the right now is really a much better depiction of where Chagas disease can be found in the world. So there's still the countries in red where there's vector-borne disease. The countries are green or where Latin American immigrants have moved, and those include Canada, European countries, Japan, and Australia. And we're the country in blue, which is really interesting because we have a lot of immigrants who have brought the disease with them. But we actually, in the lower half of the United States, have both the insect and the parasite and the conditions to be able to have domestic acquisition of disease. Although I'll tell you that for, the, for, for most of, of the patients that we see and think about, they're gonna be people who've immigrated from Latin America. So I'm, I'm gonna start really with a patient testimonial. This is a patient that I met after she gave birth to a baby prematurely at, at Children's Hospital down in DC. Uh, the baby was born quite sick and, and actually I, I think Dr. Edwards um, knows quite a bit about this patient. And I was then um, asked to see her to treat her. And she just has a few words to say about um, this illness. Her name, uh, she preferred to actually to have her face pixelated for this video because there's stigma associated with Chagas disease. And she didn't want anybody actually thinking ill of her son for having had the illness. Mama de dos hermosos niños. Me enteré que tenía el mal de Chaga cuando mi niño menor nació prematuro. Eh, él está actualmente eh, bien, recibió el tratamiento. Mi persona también recibió el tratamiento para evitar que aumente el riesgo de la enfermedad y estar yo más tranquila si decido tener más niños. So it used to be that I would transition immediately into a discussion about what is Chagas disease, but I realized that now in the online era, when any of you could decide that you're totally bored with this, don't think it's relevant for you and you can just hang up, that I ought to convince you that it actually matters to you in your practice here in the US. So why do we care we're not gonna see Chagas disease? Well, right off the bat, there are about 18% of US citizens who, who maintain that they're Hispanic according to census data, and 34% of them are foreign born. And those are the people that we're actually really concerned about. The CDC estimates that there are about 300,000 cases in the US, about 40 to 50,000 cases of cardiac disease. And they also estimate that there are 40,000 women in, uh, who are infected who are of childbearing age, which would then translate to about 63 to 315 infected babies per year. And because of this, this a CDC actually recommends screening for Chagas disease in women who are at high risk, and those are Latin American immigrant moms. So there's actually some data within the United States. This is not specific to, to, um, to the labor and delivery population, and Dr. Edwards will talk more about that later. But there, one of our colleagues who works in Los Angeles County in California decided to look at her heart failure population, and she looked at Latin American immigrants who were foreign-born who had non-ischemic cardiomyopathies and found that of the 135 patients she screened, about 19% of them had Chagas disease as the cause of their cardiomyopathy. She then went on to look at her patients who had abnormal EKGs in this at-risk population and found that 5% of all patients with bundle branch blocks, 18% of patients with bifascicular blocks, and 7.5% of pace patients with pacemakers had Chagas disease as the cause of their cardiac conduction disease. She then went on to look at about 5,000 people in a community-based screening program and found that 1.24% of them had Chagas, but and more impressive, about 3.5% if they were from El Salvador. And there are certain regions from Mexico that had a higher risk as well. So to talk a little bit about in the DC area, this is some of the, um, some of the, the uh, data that I was uh, involved in gathering, just, but just in general, focusing down here, and, this, and some of this can be extrapolated to the Baltimore Latino community. There are about a million people who are Hispanic Latino in the DC area for the 2018 ACS. 
And we have a higher, Maryland, DC, and Virginia all have a higher than average rate of foreign born uh, Latino population. What's really interesting about our particular Latino immigrant group is that our country of predominant country of origin is El Salvador, which is a higher than average risk of people coming with Chagas disease, so 32%. We also have other Latin American immigrants from um, Central American countries. And down here in Northern Virginia in particular, we have little Bolivia, and the Bolivian immigrants have very high risk rates of Chagas. So we participated with a Johns Hopkins research group that did a seroprevalence survey of Chagas disease in the metropolitan Washington area, and we screened about 1,600 individuals for Chagas disease and found a total 4% seroprevalence with a closer to 3% in El Salvadorian immigrants and in, in the Bolivian immigrant population up to 20 to 25%. And as I mentioned to Dr. Atlas earlier, um, the two published cases of congenital Chagas disease in the United States were published in the DC area. Both of these babies were born to Bolivian moms, um, one of whom was born in the Fairfax system and one was born at Children's Hospital and was that uh, the, the patient testimonial, the, the baby of that, of that mom. So I, I, just to give you those background demographics, I think you could see that if you're delivering babies to Latin American immigrant moms, there's really a chance that you're seeing Chagas disease here, and we're really not thinking about it. And as I was talking with Dr. Atlas earlier, nobody thinks about it here, really nobody, except for the small group of people for, for, for whatever reason, like Dr. Edwards and I have decided to focus on Chagas disease. So we're trying to evangelize a little bit to actually get it onto people's radar screens. So what is Chagas disease? Now to transition back to what it actually is. It's a parasitic infection that causes heart and gastrointestinal damage, chiefly transmitted by rejuvid bugs to a mammalian host. And there are over 100 reservoirs known, which is important because it's really not gonna be eradicable ever because there's what there, it can be found in wildlife. It's traditionally thought of as a disease of rural poverty in which a domiciled nocturnal bug feeds on sleeping victims. It lives in cracks and crevices of poorly built houses and chicken coops. So these are some examples of the kind of rural housing that um, an at-risk immigrant might have lived in as a child, where you can see there's not much plaster on the walls, there might be palm frond roofs, there might actually not be much in the way of walls at all, which can allow for the passage of, of the domestic animals in and out of the house, and as we've already discussed, the domestic animals might in fact have Chagas disease, so it really just keeps the bugs and all of the people who are at risk in a very close environment. And I think this is a really nice example of actually what this infestation might look like. You can see that somebody's peeled some plaster off of the wall of this house, and you can see two of the, of the bugs sitting there. So these are what these bugs are. They're triatamine insects, and they're known by a variety of names, kissing bug, insecto asesino, vinchuca, chinche, barbero, chipo, and pito. And one of the reasons why this is actually important to know if you're thinking about Chagas disease is actually having seen the bug, recognizing it, really increases the risk that you might have Chagas disease. So if I come across a patient in the hospital where I'm worried about them, I'll show them a photograph of one of these bugs. And if they say, yes, I've seen them, to me, it really makes me more worried about them. So this is what it does. So this is the bug. And it actually can be quite large. I mean, there are nymph stages that are smaller, but this bug can be center long. So it lands on you, actually it generally crawls onto you at night. It's pretty big, so you probably brush it off of yourself if it landed on you during the day. And it puts its very thin proboscis into your skin and it has its blood meal. And the bugs that are particularly effective at transmitting the disease have a very fast gastrocolic reflex. And what they do is they evacuate. So this is actually infected fecal material that's landed on the person. And then the person is actually and generally involved in moving this infected fecal material either into the bite wound or into the oral, the the, uh, the ocular conjunctiva where it can then actually seed the blood. And that, so that's the method of transmission. This is what the parasite looks like. It's Trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, um, uh, Carlos Chagas named it after his, um, his mentor, Oswaldo Cruz. There are at least six different strains. But really, the main strains are T. cruzi 1 and T. cruzi 2, and there are several uh, substrains. The cardiac pathophysiology, which is also the same as the gastrointestinal pathophysiology, is really fourfold. There's parasite persistence, even if we can't find it easily in the blood, that can last really throughout somebody's entire life. Uh, and this leads to a, a, a areas of lymphocytic infiltrate in the smooth organs, a smooth muscle tissues of either the gastrointestinal tract or the cardiac system. There are microvascular abnormalities with intimal proliferation and arteritis that can lead to abnormal vasodilatation and watershed ischemia. There are autonomic derangements because the parasite likes to land in autonomic nerve system termini and autoimmune mediated injury. And they all coalesce to call myocardial damage and fibrosis 
fibrosis or gastrointestinal damage in fibrosis. So this is a slide that shows um, some, uh, some of the cardiac uh, gross pathology and histopathology, and I wanna look at each of these slides in turn. So this, this actually really informs the clinical manifestations of the disease. This is a cardiac specimen from somebody who died from congestive heart failure because of Chagas disease. And what you can see is a very dilated heart with an arrow pointing to the apex where there's a lot of fibrosis and thrombus. So patients can get heart failure, they also will thrombose, and so they're at risk for having both heart failure and stroke. This is another heart that actually is much beefier, so this heart muscle is much more healthy, except at the apex where there's very focal fibrosis. And this is a hallmark lesion of Chagas disease, which can be very difficult to image, um, the apical aneurysm. And unfortunately, what this means is that this patient is at risk for having a stroke, even though their left ventricular systolic function is normal. It's very scary for us as cardiologists. This is a patient who has normal myocardium down towards the bottom here, but up here has very focal thickening of the infralateral wall. This is thought to be due to watershed ischemia. And unfortunately, this scar here is incredibly arrhythmogenic and it puts people at high risk for ventricular tachycardia. Unfortunately, also in situations where their left ventricular function may also be normal or close to normal. So as a cardiologist, we wouldn't worry about putting a defibrillator into this patient until after they've shown up with their sudden cardiac death event at a normal ejection fraction. It's very scary. And this last one is a histopathologic slide of the Hisperkinji system, which is to remind me to tell you that it's just an intensely arrhythmogenic um, disease, both for tachyarrhythmias, but also for bradyarrhythmias. So people will show up in heart block. Um, it may be not dying so much from that, but needing pacemakers, but it can be very, very um, uh, problematic. So let's shift a little bit to talk about what the disease actually manifests. And I'm focusing right now about the clinical course that would ensue after you had been bitten by one of these insects and infected that way. Unfortunately, it's really pretty nonspecific in many, fever, malaise, adenopathy. It's often not remembered as an adult. And I would say that most of my patients can't say to me, oh yeah, I remember the time that I had Chagas disease, partly because it's so nonspecific, but also because these children growing up in these infected houses are likely getting infected over and over and over again. So it's really difficult to pinpoint that one time. Uh, the, there's something called Romagna sign, which you might remember from your textbook when you learned about this in medical school. This young lady down here has it. It's painless um, uh, induration of the, of the eyelids. And that happens after uh, infected fecal material gets into the eye. It can last for a couple of weeks um, and is thought to be pathognomonic of Chagas disease. I, there's a very small percentage who are actually gonna have a very clinically significant presentation. But what is true about this phase of the illness is that if you find it, you will find parasitemia and it also responds incredibly well to antiparasitic therapy. So we're very lucky if we can find this. And Dr. Edwards will talk a little bit more about how this relates to congenital disease. So there are some other acute presentations. The first one is, and most important one for our purposes today, is congenital. I'm going to defer that to Dr. Edwards to talk more about. There are a couple of other settings where we might see this as doctors taking care of adults, which include reactivation, uh, specifically disease-induced reactivation, most, most commonly from HIV disease with CD4 counts less than 200, but also with malignancies that immunosuppress. And there are often neurologic manifestations of this disease. There can also be medication-induced reactivation, particularly from transplant immunosuppression, and those have some unusual presentations in the skin and also cardiac disease. There's oral transmission as well, which we won't see in the United States in general because usually it's from unpasteurized or frozen acai berries or from sugar cane where somehow bug or fecal material has gotten into it and just has not been treated appropriately. But you might see it in a returning travel for, traveler, for instance, who went to the north of South America and had a beverage that was really not appropriately uh, um, taken, uh, taken taken care of. And then there is a, I would say, a very small risk of transfusion associated or donor organ um, associated uh, Chagas disease, acute Chagas disease. Um, transfusion is very uncommon now, probably doesn't happen because we now screen every first time blood donor for Chagas disease in the United States. Uh, donor organ, unfortunately, not every UNOS network actually follows the same policies. And so there was a case actually within the past two years of somebody receiving a positive donor heart and that patient uh, died of very, very late a diagnosis of overwhelming manifestation of acute uh, T. cruzi reinfection. 
So now what's really interesting about this disease is that unless you're treated with antiparasitic therapy early on in the, in, in the acute phase, almost everybody passes into the indeterminate phase of the disease. And this is one in which there are really no end organ manifestations except for perhaps subclinical and autonomic dysfunction. It's defined as having two positive tests um, on serologic assays looking for antibodies against T. cruzi. Um, PCR can, in not, is not really used in the United States, but is another way, at least in Latin America or in clinical trials that people actually look to make the diagnosis. And what I would say is that it is incredibly important to remember that one diagnostic test does not make the diagnosis of Chagas disease. You must get confirmatory serology. And what that means for all practical purposes in the United States is that if you get a positive test on your lab core or your quest or your hospital-based assay, you must send blood to the CDC for confirmatory testing. Now, one thing, talking to an audience of Maryland-based physicians, which is really fascinating, is is that Maryland, I believe, is the only statewide public health department that offers free trypanosoma cruzi testing. And what they do, which is fantastic, is they'll take your specimen and for free, they will run the initial ELISA. If your patient tests positive, they then take responsibility for getting this, a, a sample of blood that they've kept to the CDC for confirmatory testing. It's fantastic because it's free and you don't then have to worry about follow, doing follow-up confirmatory testing, which means it really lends itself very well, I would say, to a pilot project for screening your, your Latina moms in the L&D um, setting. So we can talk more about that later, but it is really impressive. Anyway, to go back to indeterminate phase disease, it's the end of significant manifestations for almost everybody, actually, or a lot of people who are infected with T. cruzi. About 70 to 80% of people will have no further manifestations of the illness, although two to 5% of it per year will progress. And what do they progress to? The chronic phase of the disease. And that tends to happen 15 to 30 years after the time of likely infection. And we generally think about people mostly getting infected as children. So these are people who in their 30s, 40s, and 50s are coming down with potentially debilitating cardiac disease and gastrointestinal disease. So younger, say, than quite a number of the people that cardiologists see in their practice with bad cardiac illness. So we don't really know who exactly is going to progress Men tend to have more significant cardiac impairment, potentially a degree of parasitemia, how often people are getting reinfected, whether or not people are performing manual labor while they're infected, which is not really a great thing to do if you have a myocarditis, strain type, genetic factors in the immune response, people really don't know. Gastrointestinal manifestations happen in about 10%, and it's more common in people who have contracted the illness in South America, potentially because of the strain. So the symptoms of chronic phase, cardiac symptoms include angina-like chest pain from microvascular disease, exertional intolerance, palpitations, syncope from autonomic issues, bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmias, heart failure, and stroke. And that's because of the apical aneurysm that we saw even without or mild left ventricular impairment in atrial fibrillation. The cause of death for Chagas patients is sudden cardiac death in about 50%, heart failure in 40%, and embolic events in about 10%. The symptoms of GI disease, there's two real manifestations. One is megacolon and one is megaesophagus. And what we're talking about with megacolon when people get very symptomatic is unbelievable constipation, like really not being able to evacuate for months at a time or stooling around impacted fecal matter or fecal impaction with ulceration and Neuroglobulus or sesemia from, from microperforations. Mega esophagus presents very much like achalasia. People will get chest pain, heartburn, dysphagia. In worst case scenarios, they're going to get food retention, malnutrition, weight loss, and aspiration. So after, let's say you've decided to test your patient for Chagas disease and you've confirmed that they are positive, what do you do next? The next part of the evaluation would be the EKG with a 30-second rhythm strip. And this is the thing that's really going to define somebody to either be in indeterminate phase or in chronic phase of the disease. And what we're looking for are some of the signs that the, that the parasite has actually affected the, con the conduction system or caused scarring. And I'm going to show you a slide in just a second, actually, that shows this pretty graphically pretty well. This is actually looking at over 45 studies comparing uh, patients without Chagas disease to patients with Chagas disease in terms of EKG findings. And these are some of the most important findings that shake out in Chagas disease patient. There's left anterior fascicular block, PVCs, first degree AV block, AFib, bifascicular block with right bundle and left anterior fascicular block, complete right bundle branch block, but there are also actually a lot of other EKGs. So if you see a patient who has an abnormal EKG with a positive Chagas serology, even if they're not on this list, you still ought to worry about them and probably then send them to cardiology to get further evaluation.
So if you also then see an EKG that's abnormal and you haven't tested somebody for Chagas disease, you're for whatever reason doing an EKG in a Latina mom and you're seeing these EKG abnormalities, Chagas disease should definitely pop into your mind, even if you decided that you're not quite ready to start screening. So you should test for T. Cruzi infection. So if the EKG normal is normal, and I actually always suggest doing an echocardiogram when, it's at, when it is possible in your patients, then the patient deserves regular follow-up for progression of disease about every two to five years. And uh, in, the, um, in the L&D population, in your prenatal setting, you ought to consider strongly giving antiparasitic therapy. And I'll defer more discussion of that to Dr. Edwards. If your EKG is abnormal, time for the patient to see a cardiologist. And the next thing we're gonna do is Holter monitoring, just to look and see whether or not there are any subclinical signs of worrisome arrhythmias. I'm gonna just skip through this. Then we're also gonna do an echocardiogram. And this is a pretty busy slide, but really what I wanted to just say to you is that there's some hallmark lesions of, of Chagas disease that we see on the echo. They include that left ventricular aneurysm we've already talked about. They include that left, left ventricular infralateral scar that I showed you on the gross pathology slide. And they include worsening of left ventricular systolic function. And as patients go from being asymptomatic to symptomatic, from having normal EKGs to having abnormal EKGs, all of these wall motion abnormalities and decrease in systolic function get more and more common. What's most worrisome to me though, as a cardiologist sort of on the front lines with Chagas disease is that unfortunately some patients with normal EKGs will have abnormal echoes. The prognostic significance of this is not really fully known, but to me as a worrier, it's gonna make me probably think more carefully about that, uh, having just to do more surveillance in that patient or even more investigation, because I think that people should not have abnormal wall motion, even if they have normal EKGs, just in general, it doesn't stand to reason. So this is an echocardiogram, a patient who has Chagas disease. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, and, and it's not actually running well. But wh what I want you to focus your attention to is this area up here. This is a patient who was a 27-year-old El Salvadorian immigrant who presented with an abnormal EKG in palpitations and was found to have bifascicular block and PVCs. So we've already established it from Dr. Mamandi's data in California, 18% of patients who have bifascicular block on their EKG have Chagas disease. So certainly of concern to him. But at that point, the, you know, the cardiologists were not thinking about that. They did this echocardiogram and I will just tell you, it looked very normal from this picture. Unfortunately, after he returned with a massive MCA stroke at the age of 28, he had this echocardiogram done. And I'm not sure if you can see that there's this very bright, intense ball of, this is echo contrast media, which was given to him. And so it highlights the LV cavity. And he had an LV apical aneurysm that was because of Chagas disease. And this was his cardiac source of embolus. So this man had a massive, massive stroke, which basically has totally debilitated him. He was his family's prime breadwinner and is now unable to work because of the stroke from this apical aneurysm from Chagas disease. So there's also, we also do MRIs and many studies have shown there's an association of late gadolinium enhancement with Chagas. Unfortunately, indeterminate phase patients, so patients with normal EKGs can still have scar and we don't really know for sure, but up to 40% of people will have scarring on their MRIs. And the magnitude of scars associated with worse outcomes, there's rollover for risk stratification for AICD. Um, this pa this is, uh, these are not going to play, I'm sorry, um, but this is the same MRI from that same patient and he has this little aneurysm out here and you can see focal scarring on gadolinium enhancement. So I just wanted to use this slide then to transition to talking to prognosis and then we'll talk a little bit about treatment and then I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Uh, Edwards to talk more about what you really want to know about, which is congenital Chagas disease and screening of, of Latina moms. So the prognosis of Chagas unfortunately is really bad. This is actually a graph from the from what we call guideline directed medical therapy era, which means that these are patients from a trial where everybody was getting state of the art therapy. And if you compare the mortality of Chagas patients in red to the non ischemic cardiomyopathies that were not Chagas and ischemic cardiomyopathies, the Chagas patients still have worse outcomes uh, than these other patients. So it's really a bad cardiomyopathy, which means we want to try to prevent it from happening, which is why the idea of screening in the, in the, in the neonatal setting is so appealing. So how do we manage Chagas uh, cardiomyopathy? Well, the first question that you might have 
which everybody wants to know is does antiparasitic therapy help? So just to briefly say, there are two antiparasitic medications that are now very old. They've been around for over 45 years. One of them is benzonidazole. It is the only one that's approved for use by the FDA. And nifurtamox is the other one, which is not yet approved for use by the FDA. These are unfortunately both very toxic medications that need to be taken for 60 in the case of benzonidazole and 90 days in nifurtamox. Everybody gets side effects to them. Somewhere between, I don't know, it can be 15 to 30% of patients are going to have to drop out of therapy because of it. And unfortunately, with benzonidazole, which is the FDA-approved medication, there can be a very rare bullous skin reactions, which are, can be, as you all know, very catastrophic. So what's the data for therapy? So the good news is that seronegativization is associated strongly with therapy in newborns and children. And this is from randomized trial evidence, and Dr. Edwards will talk more about it. Um, observational data will su strongly suggest that there is a decrease in risk of transplacental passage in women of childbearing age. Unfortunately, we really do not have good quality evidence in adults that treatment will reduce the risk of developing cardiomyopathy in a patient with indeterminate phase disease. And there's one randomized trial in the adult population that actually looked at it in the cardiac setting and found that there was no benefit in hard cardiac endpoints associated with antiparasitic therapy. So what else can we do? Well, it turns out that we can actually give people the kinds of medications that we give for heart failure, just any old heart failure, uh, classic, more standard heart failure presentations. And those include ACE inhibitors, aldosterone inhabitants, beta blockers, amiodarone. Most of these have not been studied rigorously in patient populations that were entirely composed of Chagas, Chagas patients. And that's because a lot of these patients live in resource poor environments and just don't have very good access to these kinds of clinical trial settings. The echo to the right though, is an example of a patient who's receiving the absolutely state of the art therapy. This is a, a Bolivian immigrant who, I made the diagnosis of Chagas disease on the day that he received his left and, uh, ventricular assist device. So this is a transesophageal echo I did in the operating room. That is his LVAD cannula and he has horrible, horrible heart failure. So these patients are absolutely eligible for the kinds of therapies that you would give to people with catastrophic heart failure, including transplant. Although unfortunately, many of the patients that we see are uninsured and, and undocumented and therefore not eligible for them. But if they are fortunate enough to live in a place where they can get access to this care, they can receive it. Um, we also worry a lot, as I've told you now over and over again about the arrhythmias. Um, patients get both pacemakers and defibrillators. I don't really want to talk more about that except just to show you this echo of a patient. And all of these images are from patients who are from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. This patient is an El Salvadorian immigrant who was working in a Popeyes and who lifted a bag of potatoes and had sudden cardiac death. Fortunately, there was a policeman in line to get his French fries who saw him and resuscitated him with the AED in the store. He came to the hospital where he was found to have this echo. And what I have to tell you is this terrifies me because his LV function is really not that bad. I mean, his EF is at least 45%. So this is somebody I would not have put a prophylactic defibrillator into unless I was to try to restratify him appropriately for which Chagas patients deserve. So, and this last case here is from a woman who presented to Washington Hospital Center with a stroke. And this is a woman who is an El Salvadorian immigrant in her 70s. She's showing us exactly how thrombogenic this disease can be. This is a left ventricular apical thrombus here with the setting of an apical aneurysm. She also has lower LV systolic function, but we have to worry about this in these Chagas patients. So that concludes my part of the remarks, and I'd now like to turn this over to Dr. Edwards. And Morgan, can you take over now in terms of speaking? I can. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Dr. Atlas, for having me. Am I transmitting okay? I can hear you. Great. So, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Marcus has has shown the the some of the really fearsome outcomes um, resulting from Chagas disease that that is not found until until complications have occurred in end organs, and and the presentation in infants is also difficult because um, even in among those infants that that acquire infection from their moms uh, and have congenital infection, they they often appear healthy at birth, and um, untreated, they although they are presenting with acute disease, we miss them if they are are without um, signs at birth and are at risk for developing the same life threatening cardiac and less commonly gastrointestinal disease decades later. 
And I always like to, to, to say that the, the 10 to 40% of infants with congenital Chagas disease who have findings at birth present uh, similarly to other congenitally transmitted infections. For example, the, uh, a child with Chagas disease could be mistaken for one with syphilis or cytomegalovirus infection as examples, because most often if they do have findings, their hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, or anemia, thrombocytopenia, that are not distinctive um, and don't suggest Chagas disease um, as, a, as, a, as a specific diagnosis. Fetal hydrops and myocarditis and meningoencephalitis can also occur, but are less common. And interestingly, of the two infants who have been diagnosed in the United States to date, both did present with fetal hydrops, which is kind of a tip of the iceberg presentation. But none of these findings is pathognomonic for Chagas disease. Can you advance the slide? Thank you. The, the way to test for suspected congenital Chagas disease is, is, is to realize that this is, that the baby who has congenital infection is in the acute phase. And so this is one of the only places where one can look at a blood smear from the baby and directly detect the parasite because they will have a high level of parasitemia. That's diagnostic as po if positive, but it's less sensitive than PCR which is the diagnostic test of choice for congenital Chagas disease. Um, the PCR for T. cruzi is available pretty much only at the, at the CDC parasitic uh, division laboratory. Uh, the testing is all approved. And if you suspect the disease in an infant, that is the test to perform. The parasites multiply during the first month of life, so an infant actually can have a negative PCR right after birth. So if you strongly suspect it, a PCR should be repeated at one month of age. Um, the, the, the best way to identify at-risk babies would be if we were screening uh, moms during pregnancy to find out if they had chronic disease. So if, um, if a baby presents with suspicious findings, then one of the first things to do would be to order serologic testing on the mom if that had not been performed. So if the PCR is negative in the infant and the maternal serology is positive, the best way to exclude congenital Chagas disease is just to follow the infant and see if that positive um, serology in the baby is because um, of, of passively acquired maternal antibodies. And if an infant is exposed to a mom but not infected, the serology should be negative by nine to 12 months of age and that infant has, has excluded disease. Can we move to the next slide? So trans, transmission occurs transplacentally um, in the second or third trimester of gestation. Not in the first trimester, there are not congenital malformations associated with congenital Chagas disease. And there's no evidence to suggest that transmission occurs during the intrapartum period as it does, for example, for hepatitis B or, or, or postpartum. The mothers themselves if uh, usually have acquired their infection in the endemic region and are in the um, indeterminate phase, that is they're without symptoms. So there's nothing to distinguish um, either mom or baby unless we're screening. Transmission rates probably are a little higher just due to continued um, exposure um, of moms in countries where T. cruzi is endemic than in those where it's not. Um, but we consider in the United States that transmission rates are in the range of one to 5% for babies born to moms with silent infection. Next. Factors that, that enhance transmission are, are those that, that give mom a higher parasitic load. And um, uh, Dr. Marcus mentioned that there are several genetic lineages of the parasite, but the role of genotype on transmission has not been well characterized. It certainly could impact transmission because um, there are geographic distinctives of um, genetic lineages in, in endemic regions, but that's not all sorted out. 
What is known for sure is that if a mom has HIV co-infection, that that will increase risk for transmission and that there are clusters described in families, but not a specific genetic predilection. There are um, there's some evidence both, both for increasing maternal age, enhancing transmission, um, and uh, because of placental insufficiency. Um, but but uh, young maternal age, very young maternal age, can also be a factor because of the short time since acquisition of infection. Next. So, so what should we do? I, the, 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 the strongest message that I would like to put forth is that this is an, it would be optimal to make diagnosis both for the sake of the mom herself and for her infant to, 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 uh, to obtain a diagnosis uh, during pregnancy. Um, screening would be optimally performed not actually at admission for delivery, but earlier during gestation, perhaps during the time of, um, of screening for other infectious diseases at the, um, at the intake visit for the prenatal exam, or even during third trimester uh, screening. Women are at risk should, should be screened if they've lived in an endemic region. Um, particularly with the type of housing that Dr. Marcus has described, um, that really enhances risk. But but people who have visited and lived in an endemic region for for six months or longer are at risk and should undergo screening. And the neonates born to at-risk moms who were not tested during pregnancy should be screened. I think my last slide is the next slide. So. So if, if one undertook screening, it could be performed in any trimester. It, it would not change the detection rate if you did it early in pregnancy versus later, or even at admission for delivery. Um, a, a commercially available IgG, as Dr. Marcus has mentioned, is the test that one should order. Um, these um, are send out tests from most hospital laboratories. I'm not sure about yours there. But, but at least at ours down here in Texas, we have to send out the screening test to one of the commercial labs. And the results are available usually within two or three days. So it's not a long turnaround time. The cost is approximately $50 for the IgG screening. Um, in, in some commercial labs, IgM is tied to IgG. You can't order an IgG separately. Uh, it's not necessary to have IgM screening because these moms don't have acute infection, but at times it not, it's not possible to unlink the IgM test. So just know that if you have to order it, um, it will add to the cost, but um, you may not be able to select the commercial lab to get just the IgG. So for IgG screening, it is about $50 and it can be added um, in some states to routine maternal screening. So I would, would um, encourage you with your practice there to, to, to begin to think about um, sending screening for, for moms who are from endemic regions, both for the mom's health and for that of her infant. Thanks so much. Oh, do you want to comment on this too, Morvin? I still have oh, this. Oh, sure. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, we we did um, we did um, screen four thousand consecutive infants here in Houston several years ago at our one of our hospitals um, that has a large um, indigent population. The these were residual specimens, so we used chart information to see what country the mother had claimed as her country of origin. And it doesn't always mean that, that she was, had, had been born there. So that, that is one of the weaknesses of the study. But be that as it may, we had um, 28 screen positive samples or 0.7% um, by um, Shaga test ELISA performed in collaboration with CDC and then additional confirmatory testing at CDC, looking for different antigens of T. cruzi, confirmed infection in 10 women. And we were um, able to follow those infants up and, um, 
and oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we were able to follow the infants, refer the moms for treatment, and fortunately, none of the infants that we followed out their serology had congenital infection. Thank you. Take it away. <laughs> so, so what do we do with the information that we've just gotten? And and I I, I think. I would echo everything that Morgan just said so well. Um, I think there's actually, if from my perspective, when I'm speaking to cardiologists or people who are taking of, of care of people outside of the prenatal setting, I want them to, I mean, I would love it if they would screen every Latin American immigrant who's from an endemic country, but particularly I'm exhorting my cardiology colleagues to look for it in EK, when patients have the EKG abnormalities or echo or MRI findings that are suspicious and patients with cardiomyopathies. But I really feel like we do have um, some pretty compelling reasons to look in, in the prenatal um, setting, as, as Dr. Edwards already mentioned, particularly given the fact that in Maryland, we can do it. I mean, it, it's the, all of the, the cost data is very important to present, but here we can do it for free. And the one thing that I would like to add, which I think is, is really important, is that it, you, you heard Dr. Edwards present her 4,000 patients that they screened. You think, well, they screened 4,000 and they didn't get one. You are going to have to look a while maybe before you get your first case. But you think about the, the screening that we do for inborn errors of metabolism in neonates. The risk for congenital Chagas is actually high enough that it could easily be on the list of things that we screen for if we're looking in babies of, of Latina moms. So I wouldn't be deterred by the fact that, that it's not so easy to find them yet. These are babies for whom the potential ramifications of, of finding this disease and treating it when they can be cured is incredibly cost-effective. So that, that's really, I think, what my parting comments would be about this, um, except for one last thing, which is that we would love your help in spreading the word. So it can be hard to get onto people's agendas these days, and Chagas disease, most people hear about it, and they think, never seen a case, never going to see one, I'm not going to bother looking at that webinar. So if you have the opportunity to reach out to your colleagues who see other, who have other practices that have a lot of immigrant moms, Latina moms, uh, we would be incredibly grateful for the opportunity to reach out to them as well so that we can continue to spread the word. And thanks very much for letting us have the opportunity to do that today. So open up the floor to any questions for either of us. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Well, thank you. Dr. Marcus and Dr. Edwards. Um, I, I have to admit before this time, I really, the Chagas disease is not on my radar. Um, and the reality is, is we have a fairly large population of Latinas that, and Hispanic women um, that deliver and in our region. Um, so if, so from any of the countries that you've mentioned, those you recommend that all, all these women get screened. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, and Morvin, I think Morvin probably helped draft the recommendation, but that's actually CDC recommendations as well. So it's not, obviously it's not in your guidelines and we'd love for it to be there, but, um, but yes, we, we, we feel that that would be very appropriate. Remembering that we're looking at Chagas endemic regions, which means if your mom is from Puerto Rico, Cuba, or the Dominican Republic, that they are not at risk for Chagas disease. But our, as, as we were discussing, our immigrant population in the Maryland area is actually enriched for people who are at higher risk for having Chagas. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of people from Central America um, coming and who live in and deliver in, in our area. I mean, quite a bit. Well, and I saw somebody say this is a study we could do. I would certainly, uh, Morvin, I'm going to offer on your behalf, and I know you're so bit Morvin, I don't think if I mentioned uh, that Dr. Edwards is a pediatric infectious disease specialist who is unfortunately on the front lines of the battle of, of coronavirus currently in Houston. But if you're thinking about um, uh, doing a study, there'd be nobody better to talk to about how to design it than her. <laughs> so. No, you're very kind and gratefully, <laughs> there, gratefully there are less children. Um, becoming ill with COVID-19, um, but it's impacting us all. I, it, yes, it would be a, a lovely study to do I, until, we, until we have more evidence to document the need for screening 
for, for benefit of moms and their infants. It will be difficult to go to, to uh, groups like the ACOG and ask them to draft a policy statement. Um, it, it, but I view this as analogous to the, to the head of steam that's been mounting, particularly in the, in the opi opioid epidemic for routine maternal screening for hepatitis C. And I, Chagas is behind that in terms of our database, but, but in order to gather data, we have to do studies and we have to begin to show that there are um, not uniformly in the United States. And it's a whole conversation whether to do routine screening of everyone to find um, the Latina moms who are positive, but it, targeted screening can be incorporated also. And I think we, we need to gather data that says we do have these women with infection who, who are at risk for and up to 5% of the time do transmit the infection to their babies. And the babies, if you can identify them at, in the first year of life, are essentially uniformly cured by treatment. And so that erases their risk for later heart disease. And similarly, if we identify the moms and provide treatment for them after they finish uh, with breastfeeding, there are good data to show that that reduces the risk to subsequent pregnancies and that it lowers by about 75% the chance that that mother will later develop heart disease. It may not totally remove parasites from all uh, adult women in the childbearing years, but it will substantively improve their prognosis for later longevity. So the, there's a question there, uh, are there children with negative smears and PCRs in the first month who are later found positive by serology? I think that the concern there is that, in, um, that we, at least for some of the infants that, that I've cared for, um, for example, by a route where the mother donates cord blood to a cord blood bank and so the, um, so the mother's screen at the cord blood bank leads to a referral to me of the baby. And if the baby is two to three months of age or older, um, the, the circulating parasitemia is no longer occurring. So it's more of a time frame problem than that there are children with negative PCRs in the first months. With congenital infection, if you do screening, for example, at birth and one to two months of age and it's negative, you have eliminated the possibility of congenital transmission. But so often the ones that we even are finding are not found until they're older. And then you have to follow the serology out. I, I think um, one of the things just uh, which you uh, raised, which we hadn't really talked about is that the reason why I think we only have two cases in the literature reported of congenital transmission in the United States is because there was a very, very rigorous definition of what you of, of a congenital case that needed to be a baby born in a hospital who was identified as being sick or, or having Chagas disease at that moment, which means that many of the children who we have also seen with Chagas disease who probably got it here are not counted as congenital cases because say they went back to Bolivia with their parents for vacation. You can't know for sure. It's certainly possible they went back to an endemic environment, but I, I, I can say that I've, I've treated other individuals where I've had a strong suspicion that they had congenital Chagas disease and, and, and did not have mediated disease. So, Dr. Edwards, in, in down in Houston, are you are the OBs routinely screening women uh, from uh, high risk areas routinely? I, I no. the The short answer, Dr. Atlas, is no. We are not routinely screening. So, so it's a kind of a not yet. That's how I'd like to answer it. Why Why do you think that is? Because the incidence is so low. That I think that that's part of it, and and what 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 Rachel started with that is just not on on our radar. It's, and if we don't think about it, and it's not done, and and it's not yet 
um, incorporated as as an infection for which routine screening should be should be obtained during pregnancy. So so it's just it's not fun. what 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 the introductory phrase I some it's not on our radar yet. <laughs> and we, we need to increase awareness to to uh, to promote screening. Well, I think there's a corollary, though, that is just an unfortunate reality for many of these women. I, I'm not sure what it's like for the patients that you see, but when I try to pitch Chagas disease screening in a variety of settings, which are not like Maryland, in which we have the opportunity to have free testing, the the Fifty dollars a head is extremely expensive, you know. And at this point, as long as it's it, unless you can get it bundled into your prenatal package of testing, it's a it's a huge added expense to to do it as a routine um, as a routine expense. So I, I think because many of these women are getting their care through county clinics or through clinics that are designated for for low income or undocumented women, um, that adds further to the burden. It's just, it's, they're such resource poor environments that it, it becomes very onerous to think about adding on e the, the time even, or, but particularly the money to, to start to screen for something new. And that, I think that's why both Dr. Edwards and I feel so strongly that we need to get the data to be able to promote it because without it, it becomes very diff difficult to, to pressure people to add that to their, their armamentarium. I agree. Cost considerations are are major, and especially for for this for those at risk. Yeah, but I mean, if Maryland really does, in fact, uh, provide the ability to pay for it, then um, it would seem very easy to perform in our state, at least. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. Is there a, is there a story behind Maryland's willingness to perform free screening? There is. Fortunately, I have not disabused them of this notion, but so as, I, as we discussed earlier, there are they're both the insect and the parasite uh, in the lower 50, 50, lower half of the United States, and that includes Maryland. And someone in the public health department decided that there were people at risk of getting Chagas disease in Maryland, literally living in Maryland and getting bitten in Maryland. Therefore, it was worth instituting a free screening program. So... That's great. <laughs> that that is great. Yeah. Interesting. Well, any other questions for either Dr. Uh, uh, Edwards or Dr. Marcus? You can unmute yourself and ask your question if, if you'd like. All right. Three, two, one. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcus, Dr. Edwards. Stay well, stay healthy. Uh, and uh, thank you all. And I guess in two minutes, you need to come out of this Zoom meeting to go into the next meeting, which is an administrative update from Dr. Harmon Crimmins uh, for all of us in uh, for coronavirus and COVID-19. Thank you very much again, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Marcus. It was nice to see you both on Zoom. Thank you. Thanks thank so you much for having us. All right, bye-bye now. Bye.